Okay. Um, when everything goes the way you want, career-wise, career -wise, family-wise, friend-wise, and you are about to retire, but you feel a subtle, barely detectable dissatisfaction, and you're not sure why. What specific things should you do besides ordaining and becoming a monk? <laughs> Would appreciate no broad stroke, quote, follow the Eightfold Path answers. <laughs> follow the Eightfold Path. <laughs> Is dukkha arising from <laughs> um, that's funny, that reminds me actually of a, uh, an incident uh, many years ago. We were helping a little bit to look after a very uh, uh, elderly uh, Cambodian monk, Bhante Damo, uh, Damawara. And um, there was kind of a dis he was living at the city of 10,000 Buddhas and being cared for there by various numbers of people. And we go down and visit him. and. Um, uh, there was one time when uh, his, uh, uh, some of his lay followers, uh, not the ones who were really actually doing the actual caregiving, but were kind of kibitzing around uh, what kind of care he should get, and they were kind of arguing over him um, about whether they should do this or they should do that, or you know, whether they should take this approach or that approach, and kind of disagreeing. And Bhante Demolar was just kind of lying there. He was about 107 at that time, I think. He died at 108 or 9. And anyway, uh, they were going back and forth, and finally one of them turned to him and said, Bhante, Bhante, what do you think? What should we do? And he looked, he kind of opened his eyes and said very slowly, I think that you should follow the Eightfold Path. <laughs> so it was a broad stroke answer that he gave. <laughs> But it also kind of cut the arguing down, cut it out. So it's actually not a bad answer. <laughs> um, but uh, just, you know, the one thing that uh, is notable from this question is that uh, there is this subtle dissatisfaction, even when everything is going our way, uh, career, family, friends. You've got everything you want. You're about to retire. Um, <coughs> But uh, there is this subtle sense of dissatisfaction. Um, there's a famous quote that uh, I always like to mention somewhere along the line that uh, it's, uh, there's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, and it's getting what you want. Um, because uh, you realize that anything in the conventional world uh, anything you know in found in sangsara, the rolling on, uh, even if it's the best of all possible conditions uh, that you can find in the world, uh, it can't ever completely fulfill or provide true satisfaction, because eventually it changes, and that urge for those, even those skillful states, you know, having a good career, having good family, having good friends, um, even those. Uh, move on, change, adjust, and if we're, if we're attached to them, then um, we experience this sense of dis-ease, Ill, being ill at ease, because uh, we've lost something that we've enjoyed in a conventional way. Um, and uh, what we're left with is trying to find something to fill the empty space that's left. So the wanting, even on a subtle level, is always there, and the wanting of things to be, you know, different from what they are, uh, creates even this very uh, subtle uh, sense of dissatisfaction. Because uh, if you take refuge and look for stability in things that are inherently, by nature, unstable and changeable, then you will experience dissatisfaction, suffering, dukkha. So really the only thing to do is to start looking at um, what it is uh, and how dukkha arises, how dissatisfaction arises, even subtle dissatisfaction when you've got everything that you think that uh, is good in the world. Um, uh, it's actually 
if it's part of the conditioned realm, it's never going to be good enough. Uh, so rather than looking for something else, you start bl examining what it is that you can let go of and what, what, what it is that you're holding on to, what it is that you're attached to, and you start letting go. And there's a different kind of uh, joy and uh, bliss and peace uh, in uh, letting go rather than trying to, to get whatever it is, even if it's subtly pleasant mind states or even high meditation states. Uh, the true peace is found in uh, letting go. So um, you just have to start, you know, really orienting yourself to that aspect of the practice uh, and make a commitment to um, refuge uh, in uh, that uh, that uh, starting to, in retirement's a great time to do it, starting to uh, let go and simplify uh, and rather than continue to accumulate. Mm, let's see. There's a few questions here that kind of in the same vein. Uh, what would be the most difficult thing for you if you were to go back to lay life? And what would be the most enjoyable, fun, nice thing about lay life? <laughs> That's an easy question to answer because I have no intentions to go back to lay life. <laughs> so there, will, there is no difficult thing for me to go back to if, there, if I were to go back to lay life because I'm not going, I don't have any plans to. <laughs> um, and I think my answer to that first question kind of answers that second question of what would be the most enjoyable, fun, nice thing about lay life. Well, you know, I kind of, I mean, this isn't to diss, you know, having enjoyment in, in life uh, at all, but um, I spent the first 40 years of my life having fun <laughs> and uh, kind of just, you know, to kind of got tired of it at least that kind of fun, you know, and uh, it was sort of like been there, done that, you know, how I many, I had also similarly, you know, good career, good family, good friends, you know, uh, pretty much anything in the material world that I wanted, uh, enjoyable, you know, times, lots of good activities, you know, uh, bicycling and movies and good food and, and, you know, oftentimes at the end of the day I would, think, okay, well, what was that all about, you know? Um, it wasn't bad, it was enjoyable, but it's gone, and now I have to try and find something else to do that's going to, to make, make it all fun and enjoyable and, and, and nice. Um, and then somewhere along the line, I met up with uh, this tradition and Ajahn Pasano and Ajahn Amaro and Ajahn Sumedho and realized, oh, you know, these people, are out having fun like I am, and they seem to be a whole lot happier than I am. <laughs> so happiness isn't necessarily related to fun um, in the traditional sense of it. Um, and so, um, yeah, don't, uh, I mean, if, if for some reason I did end up as a lay person, back as a lay person, you know, through some force or, you know, some sort of uh, authoritarian government coming in and forcibly disrobing me or something like that, I'd probably try and hang out with uh, the other uh, former monks and <laughs> sit around and talk Dhamma and meditate and, <laughs> and uh, go about that just in different clothes. <laughs> And similarly, if you could give just one advice, or maybe three or four, to someone who lives a lay life with no intentions on becoming a monk, what would it be? Thank you. Well, you know, if you're looking for, you know, um, something that's a bit deeper and more sustaining um, in terms of enjoyment and peace and happiness, um, then uh, as much as is possible, you know, I just really encouraged to make whatever your livelihood and whatever your situation is to 
start turning to make uh, the Dhamma the center of your life. That you don't have to be a, a, a monastic, a monk or a nun to, to make the Dhamma the center of your life. You can have a very skillful Dhamma-centered life um, with uh, the people that you choose to be with, choose to be around the right people who are going to support that um, and gradually let go of the relationships that, that don't support that um, and then just keep on you know, focusing your life in that way. Uh, and the most important thing is really just surrounding yourself with people uh, who, who are like-minded. Um, if you don't have that support of Kalyanamita, spiritual friendship, then it's, it's very, very difficult. Do you notice a difference in monks or the monastery and their practice depending on the country or region they are located in? Like more laid back in California and more something else somewhere else? Um, it kind of depends um, on the monks and the monastery and the, or the monastics, the monks and the nuns and the monasteries that they're in and practicing in. And, um, you know, there are a lot of similarities, say, in the... Uh, in our particular Ajahn Chah forest tradition monasteries, whether they're here in the States or back in Thailand or in Europe, England, and all the places around the world where we have monasteries, you can, as a monk, you can almost go to any of these monasteries that are in our tradition and practicing in the same way and feel immediately at home um, and that it all feels quite familiar. Of course, there's going to be some differences based on location, culture, you know, the uh, ways that we've, you know, in, s in small ways adapted to our, tra our tradition is adapted here to some of the Western cultural uh, values here at Abayagiri in California and the ways, the things that we talk about to uh, um, uh, the supporters and friends around us uh, kind of sometimes have a different flavor than how you would in, say, in Thailand. But um, I would say that, um, and then of course, if you have different traditions altogether that emphasize different things in, in uh, Buddhist monastic life, then there will be different different flavors. But um, you know, basically, it comes down to everybody suffers and everybody's looking for a way out of it, and so that's the the common thread. Uh, and with that as a common thread, you know, there's a whole lot more similarities than differences. Mm. I was reading somewhere about the Buddha, the awakened bright with splendor, day and night. How do dream states inform our awakening? Um, there's not a whole lot, in, at least in, the, in our tradition, that talks about you know, using dreams or analyzing dreams um, uh, to inform our lives during our waking hours. Um, you know, there are some references to causes of different kinds of dreams and what different dream states might mean, um, but very little really, um, you know, and, and it, it's, it's very uh, practical. It's just sort of like, you know, some dreams are caused, you know, are just kind of like rehashing of memories through the day. Some are processing certain kinds of information or feelings or problems. Um, very few, but occasionally you might find some that are sort of prophetic or, you know, prescient uh, prediction of what might be happening coming up. Um, and some of them are due to, like, what you ate before you went to bed. <laughs> so if you eat, you know, a spicy pizza just before going to sleep, that's going to affect your dreams, too. So it's all pretty um, practical-oriented. Um, some people do kind of make a practice of writing down dreams, waking up, and kind of looking at them to see if they can find out anything that uh, might uh, give them a clue as to what's going on in their world. But um, it's not something that's really um, developed to any big extent, at least in, the, in our tradition. Okay. How do we protect ourselves from others taking advantage of our kindness and generosity? Ajahn Yanako once mentioned that it can happen in the outside world. 
Some people consider our meekness and humility as weak and try to intimidate or bully us. I just freeze during such times, unable to say anything, thinking it may worsen the situation and be more harmful for me. Yeah, I think that um, it comes with experience and sometimes uh, some hard knocks, but um, being kind and generous uh, and uh, having humility um, uh, doesn't, doesn't exclude or preclude also having wisdom and strength and clarity and knowing how to uh, see the effects of what you're doing. And if, if your kindness and your generosity um, is uh, causing people to try and take advantage of you, then we just have to be aware of that and uh, realize that, um, uh, that that's not encouraging you know, good qualities in the other person by uh, bowing to that or submitting oneself to it and just letting oneself become you know, uh, or getting walked over. Um, and that, um, you know, as best as we can, we're trying not to be, we, we're trying not to have expectations when we uh, are kind to people or when we give to people. We, we do it without, to the best of our ability, we do it without having expectations of how people will treat us in return. Um, but um, it's developing that sense of discernment and realizing that, um, you can still be kind and generous and not have expectations for anything in return. And if somebody tries to take advantage of that, then you have to set your boundary and say, okay, well, um, I did what I did out of good faith, good intention. Um, I don't really expect anything uh, uh, from this person around it. Um, and they're um, trying to um, take advantage of that. Well, um, I can just, uh, at least for now, you know, withdraw from that situation. I don't have to bow to that. I don't have to support that. Um, I can just, you know, realize that what I tried to do was was good, uh, and I'll be the owner of that comma, that good intention, um, and um, the best thing I can do at this point, so that that person doesn't create any more bad comma of their own by trying to take advantage, is to just um, politely set set your boundary and, and um, if you need to, you can walk away. But not with any kind of very important to guard yourself from getting a hard heart and developing a resentment. Uh, that's, uh, that's no good either. There was another one about generosity. Is it fine to give with the understanding of the law of cause and effect, thinking that this generosity will bring benefit to the recipient now, as well as it will benefit us in the future in a similar way. Like Ajahn Yanika once said, when we take care of our elders, we create causes and conditions um, for us to be taken care of when we become old and need support. Also, like when we provide financial support to others as lay people, we will be financially stable, which is our basic necessity as a lay person. Like when one steals, it can make one a pauper. So yeah, it's good to, to uh, you know, have an understanding of law of cause and effect and that good and generous actions um, will, you know, have uh, good results, both for one and for others. Um, in the same, whether it's, you know, financial or taking care of our elders or whatever way it is that we um, find to, to be generous and to share uh, what we have with others, you know, particularly in caring for uh, other people. Um, I think it's also important to, to remember that the law of karma cause and effect isn't, isn't all that predictable. So, you know, inevitably there's the question of like, oh, well, this person did so many good things and so many, you know, generous and kind things and they've always, you know, they've never done a, a harmful thing to somebody and yet 
they're now suffering with some sort of tragedy or somebody did them wrong and you know what did they do to deserve that they've always, they've always been a kind and generous person um, or vice versa you know somebody who you know is doing horrible things you know in the world uh, and creating lots of difficulty but doesn't seem to be held accountable for it and gets away with it you know sort of like well what's where's the where's the justice there you know where's where's the law of karma there um, so uh, it's good to keep in mind that, indeed, you know, general in, in general and very specifically, actually, um, you know, doing good things creates good effects, and doing uh, unwholesome things that cause suffering creates unwholesome effects. But when and how and where that all happens is is completely unpredictable. Um, the law of of kama, you know. Uh, Intentional action um, operates over you know vast periods of time. So um, in general, we're not sure of when the effects of uh, our good actions or our uh, unskillful actions will result in you know will come to fruition. It could be in it could be right in this very moment that we experience the uh, the benefits of it, what we call instant karma, <laughs> um, or it could be later in this lifetime, or it could be in the next lifetime, uh, that the effects will um, manifest. Uh, the law of kama is so vast and complex with so many different uh, uh, factors affecting any one moment that uh, the Buddha calls it one of the imponderables. Think, trying to think it through or figure it out on any specific level will just make your head split open. So it's, uh, it's not uh, comprehensible at that level. But just to know that, you know, it's it still is a you know, uh, uh, still is the law. You know, it's a natural law of karma, this cause and effect. Um, and just you know, uh, even I mean, it's not only even. It's one of the most important things of of these um, kind actions, generous actions, uh, things uh, that we would consider to be skillful and would create. Uh, good results for ourselves uh, and others in the future is to actually engage with them, do them, and then after it's all said and done at the end of the day, go back and review and think about it, bring it to mind, uh, reflect on it, uh, and that way you're experiencing the results of it right then and there. Um, just by looking back at it through the day and the good feeling that comes up, the settledness in the mind that comes up, um, particularly if you're going to sit down for a period of quiet meditation or something like that, you know, spend a few minutes recalling uh, all of the good actions by body, speech, or mind that you've done. Um, and you'll bring about uh, very good effects right there in that moment just by reflecting on them. You don't have to wait. <clears throat> How do you deal with anger? Um, different ways depending on what's going on. Um, but um, I think, you know, one of the more important things. Uh, is to um, try your best not to act on it. Uh, action being either by physical action, like causing harm physically, or uh, action in terms of speech, what we say, how we respond to people. Um, that's kind of the first line defense, is to, is to not to not act on it uh, in a way that's going to cause harm. because. You know, oftentimes there is this immediate gratification if you're angry. If somebody does something to uh, make you angry or says something or you come up with a memory or whatever, you know, the, we want to dispel that unpleasant feeling. It's a very unpleasant feeling and the urge is to get rid of that feeling. Uh, and so we learn habits about how we think that that will best happen and oftentimes, yeah, we get this kind of quick fix by yelling back or saying something nasty or, you know, something really clever but 
very biting or harmful, um, or even more strongly by striking out in some way. Um, and that does give a very brief moment of release from that energy, but you know what you've done is just sown the seeds for making it even worse. Uh, you just transferred that energy of anger outwards and it's landed in somebody else's lap and you're just setting yourself up for an endless conflict uh, by acting on it. So um, oftentimes if it's due to a specific situation or interaction, particularly if you're in the heat of the moment and it's happening right there and you're feeling it, um, to you know, use your restraint, uh, kind of hold your tongue, and um, just to be, you know, reflective and quiet, and and kind of make a resolve to to be with that painful feeling inside without trying to expel it onto the other person. Um, and if it's so strong that it's not going to go away, and that you think that you might end up saying something or doing something that you would regret, then it's quite legitimate to just quietly withdraw until the emotion settles down and to, you know, if you can, if you can, you know, muster up the, the wherewithal to say to the other person, you know, I think right now, rather than responding, I just need to take a time out and let my, let my mind settle down before we, we talk about this anymore. So I'm going to take off for a bit. You know, maybe we can come back to this at some later time. So it's quite legitimate and good to kind of remove yourself from the situation if you don't think you're going to be able to deal with it in a skillful way. And then come back if you can, you know, when, when the emotions have settled and you can kind of approach it from a bit more uh, settled, settled place to try and come to some sort of resolution. Um, and then just internally, um, working with the feeling that comes up in the body. You know, once you're on your own and you can attend to your feelings, is to try and, as best you can, to kind of like not reiterate and regurgitate and, you know, go through the whole story over and over and over again in your mind, which is what we often tend to do, thinking that somehow we'll come up with some sort of solution that'll make us feel better. Um, and it almost never works, probably never works. And that the, um, if you can feel and experience the uh, feeling in the body, that's a lot of our practice is body-centered awareness uh, and all of these emotional states have um, their reflection in the body. So just to go and attend to that uh, with a lot, uh, trying to bring some kind of care and concern and spaciousness, lots of space to that feeling and be willing to bear with it, you know, be willing to say, okay, this is really, this really feels bad, this really hurts. Where does it hurt? It hurts right here, or it hurts right here, you know, in the body. And can I just be with that? Can I breathe with that? Can I bear it without spinning off into a story? Uh, and then just uh, give yourself a lot of uh, space and kindness to experience that and let the energy uh, kind of just settle down without trying to fix or analyze or justify or create another scenario in your mind about what you should have said or what you, you know, are going to say, because uh, that just kind of perpetuates the feeling. So working with it on a real tangible level. Um, and then, you know, once, once, if you've attended to it in a skillful way and allowed it to kind of run its course and not acted on it, then uh, your mind will be a lot more clear to actually consider how you want to practically, uh, you know, address this issue. Which kind of dovetails with the next question of how to forgive a person <coughs> who has hurt and done very wrong things to you. Um, you know, <coughs> again, if it's, you know, in the moment and it's recent, just what I was talking about. Um, but um, also sometimes we have long-term hurts um, and um, sometimes uh, the people that have uh, hurt us in some way 
uh, are no longer around or we no longer are in relationship with them, don't um, have much association, but the memories are still very strong. Uh, and the, you know, the fact that it's been kind of incorporated into the body is very strong too. Body and mind go together. Um, and it is um, a very skillful and very compassionate thing to do for yourself to work on forgiveness uh, because otherwise you're just kind of reinfecting an old wound and never letting it heal. Um, and that's a, I think it's a good uh, distinction to make uh, about forgiveness versus reconciliation. That, um, you know, like a full reconciliation with somebody where it's all kind of like worked out and everything is okay again is a very... Uh, uh, high thing to do and a very desirable thing to do and oftentimes, unfortunately, it's not very possible to do um, because you have to have the willingness uh, and the presence of, say, another person to engage in that within a very conscious, skillful way. But if that's not possible, and oftentimes it isn't, um, then forgiveness is kind of at least a one-sided kind of reconciliation where you can start working towards letting go of keeping that person in your life internally um, uh, and kind of discontinuing, say, the karmic connection that binds you to that because even, you know, you're bound to people that you have a very negative relationship with in the same way that you're bound to people that you have a very positive relationship with. So if you want to kind of let go of that karmic connection, forgiveness is um, important and it really depends a lot on who they were, where they are, what they did, um, as to how to do that. Um, and if it's very complex, um, you know, traumatic, traumatic events, that kind of stuff, then often I think, you know, finding someone who's skilled in helping people through that and engaging in a, you know, a dialogue with somebody who can clearly listen and help you sort things out and uh, help you um, cope with the unpleasant energies that will come up, you know, as you skillfully attend to these kinds of things uh, in a way that won't be overwhelming, um, uh, but also kind of starts to open up and, and let the, uh, 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 the hurt uh, come out. So some of these things are best done, you know, in conjunction with another person who has those skills to help out with it. Um, and, and then continuing on your own with uh, allowing the, the memories to come up, but trying not to proliferate, trying not to create unskillful thoughts uh, around uh, those memories, but gently feeling the feeling uh, and dropping the story uh, and allowing yourself to kind of feel it in that visceral level without necessarily getting so close that you get absorbed into it and um, get overwhelmed by it. Sometimes you have to kind of give a little space and kind of, you know, approach it very gently from the edges and stop when it's getting to be too much. Uh, but again, um, that's, if you're quite strong in your practice, you, you know, can take that up on your own in some cases. But if uh, you don't feel quite so confident that you won't be overwhelmed, then best to do with uh, someone who's skilled in helping with that. Okay. I am taken by the idea of volition. Can one enter volition without judgment? Um, not quite sure the phrasing of the question or the understanding of, of, of volition in, in that question. I don't think of someone as entering volition. Um, but, you know, volition. Eh, eh, in the sense that I understand it and that we use it in terms of Buddhist uh, philosophy or Buddhist teachings, also it's kind of synonymous with intention. Um, and uh, volition or intention um, is sort of uh, when, when that, when there is any kind of act, action by body, speech, or mind, um, if there is intention 
underlying that or preceding that or informing that kind of action, um, if there's any kind of intention or volition, um, then that is what produces comic. That is the that's comic producing activity, so that there will be a result. Um, actions that don't have uh, any intention or volition um, don't uh, have you know that kind of mental effect of, of comic producing. So like, I mean, the classic example is if I'm walking down a path and I uh, step on an ant and I didn't know I did it, do I suffer the consequences of, of killing? No, well, you, know, not, you don't suffer the comic consequences because there was no intention to kill, no volition involved. But if you see that ant and you think, oh, I don't like ants, and you stomp on it, then yes, you will experience the results of that because there was clear recognition and the intention to harm. So um, that's how volition enters in uh, with uh, comic producing activity. And certainly, you know, I'm not sure exactly, without judgment, can one enter volition without judgment? One, one there can be volitional, volitional activities or intentional activities that aren't like clearly conscious. Um, so that, you know, we can kind of feel some sort of, uh, you know, there might be a, a very like a, an underlying tendency, say, towards aversion. Um, and you act on, you know, that there's some aversion in what you do, like in killing the ant or something, but you're not necessarily saying, oh, I hate ants, so I'm going to kill that ant. So you're not clearly thinking, but you're still acting with that unskillful mind state pushing you. And it's that unskillful mind state that's pushing you, then when you act on it, then yeah, there, there is intention there. It's just that it's not necessarily conscious, you know, in the immediate moment. Um, so there still is uh, a result of, of that kind of activity. It won't necessarily be the same as if it's fully consciousness, fully conscious volitional activity, um, but uh, it will still be there at, at some level, at some extent. So I'm not quite sure if that answers the question. I hope we get somewhere around there. I'm probably not going to be able to get to all of these. Um, how to deal with self-blame associated with losing a loved one due to suicide? My aunt's son, who was clinically depressed, committed suicide. Before he took his life, he saw another death in their neighbor's place who called my aunt for help. And also, he was getting ready to be sent to rehab center for his addictions. So she keeps thinking if she should not have taken her son or gone to help the neighbor and also not trying to send him to a rehab center, he would not have taken that action. How to deal with these thoughts and feelings of self-criticism. Suicide is very complicated. There's a, like, it seems like today is the day for coming up with old sayings, but this was a saying that I once read in uh, a Stephen Levine book who worked a lot with people who were dying and um, uh, on the chapter that he, in this book on suicide, he, he said, uh, everybody has a skeleton in their closet. Um, people who commit suicide leave their skeletons in other people's closets. So that, you know, that's kind of a, a way of saying that, you know, when someone commits suicide, they leave oftentimes a very long-lasting legacy of confusion, remorse, doubt, self-questioning um, for the people who are left behind, particularly people who are close, because there's always that, what could I have done? Should I have done something different? Why didn't I notice this? Why didn't I see it coming on? You know, did I do something wrong to support it? Did I, you know, like in this situation, you know, um, should I not have, you know, tried to send this person to a rehab center, would they still be alive today? So it goes on and on and on because there's no, you know, there's no space for being able to, to reconcile that because they're gone. Um, so um, it's just very, very uh, difficult one. And again, it's like 
having to just constantly go back and say, you know, what were my intentions? Were they, were they, skill, were they good? Did I want the best for this person? You know, recognizing that um, uh, we can't be responsible or control how everybody deals with the difficulties in their life and that, um, you know, we didn't wish for them to take their life and, and who knows, you know, and, and just the process of going back and second guessing and rehashing you know, does that lead to peace of mind? And no, it doesn't. Um, and at some point, we have to realize that just that kind of repetitive rehashing, going back, uh, uh, isn't something that results in, in relinquishment, letting go, or peace of mind. Um, and we have to, in a sense, retrain our, our thinking processes to, to um, you know, start picking up more skillful uh, uh, things to think about or ways to think about it um, and to constantly reassure ourselves again with the support of other people and sometimes with people who can help you through this process skillfully professionally um, that um, you know um, we can't we can't carry the load of being responsible for people's uh, other people's actions um, when our intentions were, you know, were the best. And maybe there was something that we could possibly imagine that we could have been more skillful. But being skillful is different. You know, we all have, we all make mistakes, we all do unskillful things, but that doesn't mean our intentions were bad or wrong. It just means that we haven't had enough experience um, to be able to, to, to see every possible angle and something before it happens. So to forgive ourselves, if there is something that we can find fault with in, in what we did or didn't do, to realize that we are also um, imperfect beings and um, you know, we, we make mistakes if we do um, and we uh, need to forgive ourselves and, and, and move on at some point because the alternative isn't any good. Uh, but just to realize that you know, it's a very common thing um, for people who have family members or close ones who commit suicide to, you know, constantly question um, and to find support from other people who have gone through that. I'll just do one more because it's 4.30. Um, there's quite a few about death and meditation and cremation grounds and dealing with grief and things like that, but uh, I don't think we have time to finish that. Th today, anyway, maybe tomorrow. Um, but this, there's one that says, Ajahn is the knowing, in quotes, awareness, presence, consciousness. Can you say a little more about this? Thank you, well, it's kind of a, more than a little bit, but, uh, the word knowing, um, you know, has different, uh, different aspects to it. There's a lot of different kinds of knowing or knowledge that the Buddha talks about. And it's all the way from knowing things like facts or concepts that are, you know, kind of on an uh, intellectual basis, understanding things, words, me words and meaning teachings that we, we read about and think about and ponder about. That's a kind of, of knowing, kind of abstract, conceptual knowledge. And then there's other different kinds of knowing that the Buddha talks about, more like direct knowing, um, like directly knowing, um, say in the Anapanasati Sutta, the in and out breathing. You know, one, one directly knows I am breathing in, one directly knows I am breathing out. So really taking that direct knowledge to the bodily experience, the, the, oh, okay, not just thinking about it or conceptualizing about it, but actually really directly experiencing um, some uh, aspect of the body or the mind uh, without evaluation, judgment, proliferation, but just directly knowing it uh, in and of itself. So there's that kind of knowing. There's uh, the knowing that comes uh, with, um, like, uh, the knowledge of, you know, uh, 
the three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta, looking at experience through the lens of dhamma, is a uh, different kind of knowing. Um, and the knowing, you know, the, the highest form of knowledge is direct experience of the Four Noble Truths, seeing, seeing for oneself directly the arising of dukkha, the cessation of dukkha, and how that comes to be. So these are all different versions of knowing or understanding. And at its base, awareness, presence, um, are aspects um, of this. Uh, like awareness often is kind of, I've heard this described as kind of like the fundamental quality, the, the underlying quality of, of the mind, of the heart, citta. That's its basic, um, basic characteristic of, of citta in its pure sense is awareness. Uh, consciousness tends to be, in the Buddhist, uh, consciousness is a very tricky word because it means a lot of different things in the English language. Uh, in the Buddhist sense, it's the word that's used most often to translate vinyana. Um, and at its roots, uh, looking back at vinyana, uh, vi, vi, vi means like divided. Jnana is knowledge, so it's divided knowing or divided knowledge, and commonly refers to the knowing uh, in relation to any of the particular six sense bases. So the consciousness or the knowing related to uh, visual activity, hearing, uh, taste, touch, um, smells, and also the intellect, the mind, uh, the thinking mind, the evaluating mind. So it's the consciousness or the awareness that is constantly moving amongst all of those six um, um, sense bases. And so it is a form of knowing, but it tends to be more specific to whatever sense space is it's activated at any one moment in time to weave this sense of, of continuity. Um, so that's generally how more consciousness is used. It is a form of awareness, but it tends to be more specific. Um, so that's just a little bit of a uh, answer on, on that very broad subject of knowing and awareness. Okay, the rest we'll have to wait for another time. Okay, thank you.